types of messages than we usually bring in a short visit with a group of people. And we have been dealing with some of the stumps that have wounded the Holy Spirit and caused us to come to the period of terrible spiritual drought that is well around. We thank God that there is an earnestness and a, and a sincerity about God's people today such as we in our little ministry have never seen. I believe there are more godly pastors who are lying in bed at night wondering what's the matter with our message and our method that has got us into the sorry state that we're in today. And I think what little that amounts to that that's an awfully good thing. As I understand the scriptures, God comes on the scene when men come to the end of their ropes. There is a saying going about that God helps them who save themselves. That's a nice saying, just not so. He helps us. He comes to the rescue of a person when they reach bottom, can't help themselves, quit trying to help themselves, and look only to him. There's always been help in him, but we will not look to him as long as we think we can make it ourselves. And so the happiest thing about the present day is that in multitudes of churches, not only in America but world around, God's people are coming to a seriousness that I have not experienced in the years that I've been a preacher. And we believe that it's going to continue that way for while we think the scriptures teach that things are going to get terribly worse. Religiously speaking, we believe that in the meantime, God's going to be separating his people and calling them together. And that's good. While Satan's working in the spirit of Antichrist seems to be everywhere, the Holy Spirit is drawing his people in a way that we've not seen him in our little ministry. <clears throat> There's a young preacher in Birmingham, Alabama, some years since he was a student in Howard College, the Baptist College of the state of Alabama, and had a church on the outskirts, in the city limits, but on the outskirts of Birmingham. And uh, he was teaching the Bible on the night we call prayer meeting. That's uh, terrible thing to think that we take prayer meeting night to teach the Bible, but we can't have prayer meeting, so we think it may be the next best thing, maybe that's all right. And uh, the young fellow started on First Peter, and uh, I give you this by way of illustration to introduce my subject tonight and tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, God willing, I want to preach on the subject, What Must I Do to Be Saved? What Must I Do to Be Saved? And tonight, we're facing the question, and this is one of the big enemies of souls, and the big enemy of preaching the gospel, the perversion of what men are able to do about the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we are speaking as we announced on the subject, the men have a choice of accepting or rejecting Jesus Christ. Now to introduce that, to tell you what I want to try to do tonight, and this is a plain teaching message. Or that's what we're up against now. We are hung up on what the Bible teaches. Hung up on what the Bible teaches. Sunday morning we brought the message on the straight gate. Sunday night the narrow way. I haven't seen 
multitudes of church members since. I don't know what there was about those two messages, but there was something, and uh, I guess we'll have to widen the gate and make the road now broad, but hopefully we'll do that. But those are the teachings of the Lord. This young preacher innocently opened the Bible, as they'd announced on prayer meeting night in Birmingham, 17 years ago it was, and we were going to study through the first epistle of Peter. So all the people came, a little handful of on Wednesday night, in a Southern Baptist Convention church that was founded by people who believed the Bible and believed the old doctrines of the Word and didn't make fun of them. And lo and behold, he says, now we'll just read the scripture and we'll come in on it as we go along and ask questions. And he began to read with the first chapter of 1 Peter, chapter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. This happened before I ever met him. I met him two years later when we put on the first conference around the great doctrine of God's sovereign grace ever held, I suppose, in the Southland. We have one every year now in different sections of the country expounding these truths to preachers. And this young preacher told me about it after he met me and I met him. And he said, I read that first phrase in the second verse. And he said, wait a minute, folks. I never did see this before. Wonder what on earth this means. And it set him off. It set him off. And he lost nearly every member of his church over it. But now he's in the scene of the greatest ingathering of souls. I think that's going on in America. It's got so big that he's had to split his church and go clear across the city and start another one. Right now he's preaching to two churches. And big businessmen, college professors in Birmingham are getting saved. And it all started over this one little verse. He'd never seen it, and he didn't have the slightest idea what it meant. But he said, we better stop and see what this is talking about. A young preacher in Winston-Salem, where I live, he is telling about how his church was split. He said they were teaching the Bible on prayer meeting night and they decided to teach through the book of Acts. And so they got over to the, uh, the second chapter and they were getting along just fine. And we came on Wednesday night to the 37th verse of Acts chapter 2. And he, he, they had the custom, they'd read a few verses of scripture, and then they would, he'd discuss it, the people would discuss it and ask questions, and that's certainly good, isn't it? And so he read verse 37 of Acts chapter 2, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise, is a promise now, is unto you, God made this promise, and to your children, and to all that are far off, and As for many, as the Lord our God shall call. And he told me that, he said, wait a minute, folks, what in the world does this mean? He'd never seen it. And he split his church. Half his deacons and about a third of his people, before they got through with it, they said, we ain't going to believe no such damnable stuff as that. But the trouble about it is, it's in the book. And he split his church. See, I'm taking the position that we, we've got to challenge 
all of this spirit that in the name of being believers in Christ just plainly say there are great portions of the word of God that we will not accept. And that's going on all over the country. He told me, he said, Brother Byron, it's split it. It's split it over there. As many as the Lord our God shall call. Shall call. You see, that church was made up of people whose fathers and mothers, they, they tried to believe what the book said. But a generation's come on us now where we thought we could gain converts if we'd sacrifice the truth of the Word of God. But we hadn't gained. We just made people twofold more children of hell by getting them to make a profession apart from the truth of Christ. Now, your pastor's trying to bring to this church some of these old rock bottom truths. Association with me is having a little to do with it. He heard me some three years ago, and we've been friends ever since, and I make no apology for it. And there is much opposition. And so I challenge every Christian to be in the times when the word is taught. For instance, he tells me next Wednesday night, You'll be, you've been in the book of Romans on Wednesday night. In the book of Romans, he read it, say, now next Wednesday night, the lesson will be on Romans chapter 8. Well, for years, Baptists, ignorant Baptists, people who will not study their Bible, have been skipping Romans 8, 9, 10, and 11, but it's still in the book. And it'd be a happy opportunity for all you people on Wednesday evening, that's still the time when the Bible is expounded by your pastor to be here and just take it verse for verse. Don't get you some sinners, scissors, scissors and cut out that that you don't like. But remember that no Christian will book God's truth. If he's ignorant, just let him keep his mouth shut and say, Lord, teach me. But when he's faced with truth, He'll, he'll reveal whether it's a Christian or not, for God's people will listen to God's word. Now, that's right. And we need that desperately. You see, now that wasn't off of my subject, for I'm coming tonight to tackle something that has been taught and preached all around. And I know of nothing that has contributed to the awful, almost death-like quality of what we call spiritual life and what we're facing here tonight. I'm not here to try to be smart. I'm here to try to give you a little help in answering these awful, awful denials of truths and perversions of the gospel that are so popular today especially as preached by most radio preachers. Now do the scriptures teach that a man ought to have a chance to be saved? Do they? If they do, then the scriptures teach that Christ ought to have been crucified. Now think that through. I run into this people, oh my, and they get quite mad about it, and they gnash their teeth. And they say, I believe that every man ought to have a chance to be saved. You ever heard that? Well, if that's so, then God Almighty owes sinners the death of his son. And that's the most blasphemous thing that any human being could ever think of. Now you think that's true, and yet that's the popular gospel. There's a real belief in this election, but, but the Bible teaches it. You see, 
And when you say you don't believe in it, you're saying, we don't care if you do believe it, God, we don't. See what I mean? For if you deny the teaching of the word of God about his choosing men for salvation, then you have to preach that God chose everybody for salvation. If he chose everybody for salvation, then the better you preach the gospel, because he's already settled it. Everybody's going to be saved, live in glory, live like the devils they want down here. But the Bible teaches that he chose people, and it either teaches that he chose some or everybody. You have to believe one of them. And if you believe what the brethren say, they believe that everybody ought to have a chance to be saved, and they believe, they'll tell you, that they believe that a man ought to have a choice, ought to have the right to decide whether he'll accept or reject the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's so now, then God Almighty owed the world the death of his Son. And if God's that kind of a monster, nobody would love him. If he's a monster, that would hang his son on the cross to pay a debt he owed you. He's a monster. That's right. We do not think of the awful blasphemy of the heart of what to call gospel proclamation today. All of this terrible, blasphemous, damnable stuff putting the wills of men and making men more important than God and saying what we believe. And, you know, we've been letting it go and nobody dares to challenge it. But in the name of God, it must be challenged. God doesn't know anybody anything. God doesn't know any man a chance to be saved. Salvation is not God paying off a debt that he owes to sinful men, because he don't owe sinful men anything. Salvation's the blessed product of the God of all grace, not the God who's trying to pay off a debt. No, no. I was down in South Carolina. And the young pastor came to me after been preaching a week and said, Brother Barnum, we've come to love you in spite of your heart preaching, but he said, my people are just torn all pieces. That you've just torn us all to pieces. I said, well, uh, is that good or bad? He said, I believe it's good. God knows we need to be torn. Well, I said, what, what's going on? He said, we wonder if Sunday afternoon, if we would fill the house, we want to. Said, we'll be there if you'll meet us at 2.30 in the afternoon, not in the fear of the services. If you'll be there and let us ask you some questions. And I said, and now, are the sincere questions? You don't argue about anything? No, sir. Said, we want. Said, you've got us torn up. We don't know which way to turn. Said, you said this is wrong, that wrong, that wrong, that wrong, that's wrong. And I old Booker Barry will come in and complain about everything, you know. And uh, uh, I said, yes, you mean business. I, if I hadn't answered any questions, I would bet you would die. And so we met. And we never did get to but one question. The young pastor got up and he said, Brother Barnard, we want to ask you this question. Don't everybody have a chance to be saved? Don't everybody have a chance to be saved? And I answered them as follows. Salvation is not by chance. What people mean when they say, now I think a fellow ought to have a chance to be saved is that God's under obligation to save you. In the second place, they mean a man ought to have a chance to save himself. And then, of course, I ask them this question. Do you believe that God's under obligation to give a man salvation or a chance at it in that floor. Because if you answer that question, yes, sir, I believe every man ought to have a chance to be saved, you're really saying that God Almighty owes salvation to every man. So you got to throw the whole Bible away, Brother Devil. Just ain't none of it left. 
because it's grace, grace, grace all the way through. Man walked up to me one night this week. He hadn't been booking the meeting. He's trying to learn, and he said, "Thank you." I said, I, "I've been wanting to know how to answer all the talk that's going on. I don't know how." Well, this blasphemous talk must be challenged. Must be challenged. It must be challenged for this reason: that it's striking at the greatest teaching of the Word of God. You are saved by grace. Not by chance, not by God owing you something. If a man saves, all the fault of it is in God. Amen. And I know that we must quit parading stuff like I'm talking about tonight as Bible truth, because it strikes at the very heart of God. Does a man have a chance to be saved? Does he have a right? Do men have a right to be saved? If they do, then God Almighty is a monster if he don't give them the right. But if men have a right to be saved, then God owed the death of the Son of God. But the Bible said, I know one thing, I know I know this. That the Bible says the reason God hung his son on the cross is because he so loved the world. Not that he is in debt to us, but that wonder of wonder, grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, he so loved. That's the reason he gave his son. Not because he is in debt. Not because men deserve salvation. Not because men had a right to a chance to be saved. But because he loved. Because he loved. Now, closely akin to what we've been talking about is our question tonight. People say to me, and I hear it everywhere I go, and I'm determined by the grace of God because it strikes at the heart of salvation and because it's contributed to this generation of church members who have no hunger and thirst for righteousness and give not the slightest evidence that the Lord Jesus lives inside of them, I'm determined to take them. Do men have a choice? Do men have a choice of accepting or rejecting Christ? One of the members of the church, prominent since I've been here, has taken issues. I believe that a person ought to have a choice of accepting or rejecting Christ. But what does the Bible say about it? Let us read several scriptures. Would you listen to the scripture? This is going on all over the country. My, how they preach it. I've been listening to the radio preachers since I've been here. They preach enough blasphemous, damnable stuff to damn all the state of Tennessee. And they do it in the name of fundamentalists. They do it. Boy, they do it. They do it. I know what I'm talking about. And you listen to a lot of it. And you support them statements and approaches that are going to wipe the gospel off the face of the earth. If we don't raise up some churches that will open their Bible and dare to begin to teach it and to stand by it. In the 27th chapter of Matthew, at verse 22, is where all this business of men having the choice of presenting Christ to men and telling them that they can't be neutral. I've heard sermons on this. Now, you can't be neutral, my friend. You must accept or reject Jesus Christ. Now, I've heard sermons on that. But it's not so. It's not so. Here in the 22nd verse, the 27th chapter of Matthew, the Lord Jesus Christ in the days of his flesh has been brought before Pilate, the Roman governor of uh, Palestine, and uh, as the custom was, on the day of the feast, uh, he'd release to a notable prisoner. And he brings before the mob two people. One's a fellow by the name of Barabbas, and the other's a fellow by the name of Jesus. And he says, now here they are, which one of them shall I release? And they cried out, well, we want you to turn old Barabbas loose. All right, 
Pilate said, All right. Then Pilate said unto them, Well, since you want me to turn Barabbas loose, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they said unto him, Let him be crucified. Now, this is where this all business got started, and they say, here's a man that had a choice. He had to make up his mind what he was going to do with Jesus. But there's a white horse with a different color. This was the Roman Empire, the Roman government. He had the power, humanly speaking, of life and death. But Jesus had been brought to his tri court, just like down here at the county court or whatever kind of court you have in the state of Tennessee. And Pilate was the judge. He is the one to decide whether they're going to turn him loose or do something with him. That's a long way from coming over into the spiritual realm and presenting Jesus Christ to the faith or unbelief of men and women and saying, now he's in your hand. What are you going to do with it? In the, in the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John, the same record is given, and Pilate said to Jesus, Don't you know that I've got power over you? I can have you put to death. And Jesus said to him, Thou couldst do nothing except the Father gave you the power. And so people say, well, I tell you the Bible says, so what shall I do with Jesus? Well, the answer from the Word of God comes mighty quickly. There's just one thing for you to do with Jesus. That's to submit to it in utter faith. The choice men have, and then in choice that. Ladies and gentlemen, God Almighty did not send his son to be born of a virgin in a cave in Bethlehem to live on this earth approximately 33 years to wind up on a Roman gibbet outside the holy city of Jerusalem to be buried in another man's grave, to be raised and put on the throne. God didn't send his son to go through all that to give you a choice. He sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save it. And nowhere in the scripture is there the slightest hint that you have a choice about. Christ is not up for your acceptance or rejection. He's presented for your acceptance. For your acceptance. That's ten million times more solemn than the popular preacher. You see it? Men are faced not with a choice, but with a God-given and God-commanded duty. A duty. Christ was not sent so men could decide what they'd do about him. Christ didn't die so you could make up your mind whether you'd accept him or reject him. The gospel's not preached so that you can decide whether you believe it or not believe it. Christ is to be accepted, not accepted or rejected, but accepted. <clears throat> Let's see how serious this is. In the book of Matthew, at chapter 3, right after the Lord Jesus Christ had been baptized and filled with the Spirit, in the last verse, of the third chapter of Matthew, when Jesus came up out of the water, the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove, and something took place. I tried to read the Bible a little bit in the last 39 years, and I give it to you for what it's worth. What I'm going to read now is either so or it isn't. 
There's no ifs and ands and buts about it. This either is a fact or it's not. And lo, a voice from heaven. Now, Ralph Barnett's poor voice, but lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And I suggest to you just one, two things. Cut this verse out of the Bible, but there's many more like it will read in a minute. Throw your whole Bible away or camp there a little bit. This is what God says about this. This is God splitting the heavens. This is a miracle, young brother Sword. But you can take it or leave it, do whatever you want. Anything except just taking it for granted. God Almighty split the heavens and spoke. And a death if I heaven again now, if the Bible so. And behold a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. I've been telling you, you can't have Christ as your Savior unless you have him as your teacher. And I got good authority. My Lord said, you listen to my son. You listen to my son. This is my son. I'm well pleased in him. Hear him. Hear him. And Brother Lipton, the first thing my Lord did when he entered his public ministry as God's teacher and God's prophet, you know what he did? Then began he to say unto them, Repent and believe the gospel. Didn't he? Mark 4, Matthew 4, 17. What's the first message of this one? The Father said, This is my son. You listen to him. When he got up to bring his first message from him, this well-pleasing to the Father is the Son who's well-pleasing to the Father, the one that God Almighty split the clouds and said, Hear him. What did you say? said, I wish you folks would think it over carefully and make up your mind what you're going to do with my son. No, sir. He said, Repent and believe the gospel. You know what he said? There ain't no choice there, honey. That's just a command. That's just a command. I just come See, when you get to hell, you're going to have to suffer in hell for not paying attention and obeying my Lord's command. My Lord's command. This is serious. It's not just a little matter that you ought to take care of sometime at your convenience. This is the command of heaven. Repent ye. Who said that? The one the Father says, my son. One I'm well pleased with, and one the Father said, you'd listen to. Listen to. These little jack and nap unsaved church members going around here and popping off all over the country and getting on the radio and in the Sunday school classes and holding meetings and making fun of the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to be challenged. There's no Christianity in that. And we're in a holy war. My Lord said, All that the Father giveth unto me shall come to me. And him that cometh unto me, I'll in no wise cast out. Jesus said that, brother. You better say you don't believe it. Well, Jesus does. They get up on the radio and make fun of this, but Jesus said it. As thou hast given him authority over all flesh, I'm quoting John 17 and 2, quoting the lip from the lips of the Lord, as thou hast given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as the Father hath given me. That this preacher said, Well, be that damnable stuff. Well, the author of that damnable stuff is the Lord. Jesus Christ. 
You see what I'm doing? This same series. Members of this church. Oh, man. Somebody called up and said, Boy, do I do something? That terrible stuff's creeping in. Well, we got it from Jesus, Buddha. I don't know if it's so terrible or not. Maybe we better quit accusing Jesus of teaching damnable stuff. You see it? You see, the war is on, Brother Cope. It dead sure is. The enemies of the gospel are growing everywhere, calling Jesus a liar, calling things that we got from his lips, recorded in this book, calling them damnable things. Now, the Lord Paul said, listen to him. Amen. Amen. My Lord said, this is the will of him that sent me, John chapter 6. I think the verse is 46, I'm not certain about that. This is the will of him that sent me, that of all that the Father giveth me, I should lose not a one, and shall raise them up at the last day, and yet to get on the radio. And down on the streets and in sun school classes and revival campaigns and say we don't believe that damnable stuff. But Jesus told it. You see, we're in a war. And we if we're gonna show our colors, honey, if we don't if we continue that we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, we'll just call Jesus a liar, but keep the unsaved church people in the good humor. See what I'm talking about? You see, this war is pretty serious, and back of it all, back of it all, is the terrible, insidious cunning of the devil, who does not want men and women faced with truths. He rather they deface with perversion. Back off it, Satan. That's all on the subject. Well, ladies and gentlemen, either God owes salvation to everybody or he don't. If he owes salvation to everybody, then he owes the death of Christ to everybody. If he owes salvation to anybody, then he owes the death of Christ to that anybody. That makes a monster out of God. Christ Jesus, our Lord, is presented to men not for their making a choice of him, but he's presented, God says, repent and believe. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, this is his commandment that we should believe this is his commandment, that we should make up our mind what we're going to do with Jesus, no, sir, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. In Acts, in Acts, you know that scripture by heart, in Acts chapter 17, and the times of this ignorance God overlooked, but now tells men that he wants them to make up their minds and he's going to give them a chance to decide what they'll do with Jesus Christ. No, sir. Now God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. There's no choice here. There's a command. There's a command. He commands how many? All men everywhere to do what? Decide what they'll do with Jesus. No, sir. To repent. To repent, to repent, to repent. That's God's command. In the book of Romans at chapter 16, you can turn to them this quickly. I read you this verse, these words. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the what? 
the obedience of faith. My Lord said, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. Don't decide what you're going to do about it. Here's what God says. Repent and believe. The gospel is preached for the obedience of faith. Every time Peter makes any reference to men, what God requires of him in the gospel, it's obedience. He's the author of eternal life, the book of Hebrews says to them, who obey it. What's the command of the gospel? Repent and believe. Repent, not decide whether you will or not, but the command is. you in the army. The colonel didn't say, now, corporal, if it's convenient sometime in the next three, four months, wish you'd make up your mind whether to sweep that floor or not. He didn't talk that way. He said, you sweep the floor. He gave command. Amen. Amen. My daddy didn't say, now, Ralph, if it's convenient, we should go out and plow the field. He said, son, go plow the field. There wasn't any choice about it. It was a command. It was a command. You see, this, this is ten times tighter than the stuff they call giving everybody a chance. No, I'm giving nobody a chance. Just facing you with a command. Facing with your command. Facing you with a command. For men are confronted in the gospel with God's holy command and with God's demand. And you know, every time God, through one of his preachers in the New Testament or in the Old, tells men to repent, he does it in the imperative mood. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Now, instead of having a choice, men are faced with a duty. And men are not blank pages. Men are not machines. Men are responsible creatures. They're responsible to Almighty God. And they're responsible to obey His command. I don't know the fate of what we call the heathen. I said as much as I know how. I read books, listened to good men making a stab at it. But I just don't know. I don't know how to do with a man that's lived in Africa all his life, never been faced with the command of God in the gospel, the terms the gospel lays down, or repentance and faith in it. I don't know. I have my own ideas about it, but they ain't worth much. And I wouldn't waste your time. But I know what the Bible teaches about anybody that's ever been confronted with the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. I know there ain't but one thing for you to do. That's to bow your wicked heart and lay yourself in the hands of Jesus Christ. You're not given a choice. You are commanded to do it. You are commanded to do it. Your money... Suppose you owe a man ten dollars, and you haven't got any money to pay it. Does that discharge the debt? No, no. You still owe it. Suppose a fellow shows up down to glass plant tomorrow, they work tomorrow, dead drunk. He can't put in eight hours. Does that discharge his obligation to do a good day's work for his employer? Not at all. If a dog can love his master, a man ought to love God. And you have a duty to obey him and to love him with all of your heart, no matter what your condition is. Now, folks, I tell you this is serious for me. How can we expect people 
to have the slightest idea that they really need Christ Jesus as Savior Lord until they are faced with this terrible, not invitation to make up their mind, but this stringent command and telling men and women, listen to Brother Barnum, telling men and women that God commands them to do what they cannot do. No man can repent, no man can believe, and yet if he don't, he's going to hell. And we just got to tear up the Bible, or we got to face this fact that God Almighty, according to the teaching of the Bible, he commands all men to repent. Any way to get around that is Acts 17 and 30. And yet a man cannot tear himself off the throne and enthrone Christ. A man cannot hate his nature and abhor himself. Now, a man can quit drinking liquor or chewing tobacco or doing things like that, but a man cannot give himself another nature. And a man just can't love God with all of his heart, but if he don't, he's going to split hell wide open. You see, people are not lost today. The members of this church, the Sunday morning people, they don't feel any need of sins forgiven and a Lord to rule over them. How could they? They've never been faced with the fact that this is how lost people are, that they're so plumb lost they can't do what God commands them to do. Now, if a man can repent without the Holy Spirit, if a man can believe the gospel, Without the miracle of the Holy Spirit, then a man may be in pretty bad shape, but he ain't lost. If a man's lost in the forest, and he's getting off the dark, and, and he, he, he knows the way out, and he can find it himself, he ain't lost. If a man's a big sinner, and he's on his way to hell, but he's got the right and the privilege and the ability some of these days as men tell me I'm going to get right with God. If he's telling the truth, he's in bad shape, but he ain't plumb lost. I'm screaming up and down, America! Most times I get a hearing. I thank God for it. I haven't this time, but that's not the way it is most places. God working all over this country. Hear me? to him a man up to the truth. But he's in the ditch and he can't get out. If the Lord don't come and deal with him where he is, he can't get up out of that ditch and get to the hospital and get well. He's in that ditch and his legs are broken and his eyes are punched out and he can't hear thunder. And his ribs are caved in, and he's no condition to get up and walk ten miles to a hospital. And I'm fighting this stuff they call the gospel, that God's done all he can do to save a sinner, and now, sinner, it's up to you. Old sinner's can't. He down there in the ditch, and he can't walk, and he can't see, and he can't hear. How's he going to get to the hospital? According to what they call the gospel now, I believe a man or to have the ability he ought to let him decide about this. Well, what good to do that old boy? Both his legs are broken. He can't get to God. Tell him he'll do his part. Well, just what part can he do? The only thing on God's earth he can do is there in the ditch utterly unable to get out is to look up. He can't make it himself. But there's life in the look. There's life in the look, amen. There's life been always been a life in the look. Look at life. Well, I'll make it for me day, preacher. I'm going to be saved. You're going to do it. No. No salvation something the Lord does. The Lord does. We say, Brother Barn, if I can't repent, if I can't believe, just have to go to hell. Yes, if you want to. 
Maybe you want to spite God, go on to hell. I don't think it'll hurt him so much, but if you don't want to, I'll tell you what you can do. Do what the scriptures say. Become a seeker. Become a caller. That old boy in the ditch with his legs broken, he could start looking. Oh, for somebody to come and help him get him out of the ditch. He could start calling. Start calling. Start calling. Oh, God. Work thou within me. Make me able. Make me willing. Do thou for me what I cannot do for myself. That's all on earth a man can do, but thank God he can do that. He can do that. He can do that. He can do that. Faced with the fact that hell is the portion of all who in die impenitent. If you don't repent, you're going to hell. The rich man went to hell, and the reason he did said, I, I, I didn't repent. said, if you go talk to my brothers, maybe they'd repent. But he said, Brother Barnum, you just got through saying the Bible says I can't. Yeah. But if you don't, you'll go to hell. If you can't do it yourself, you become a caller on God. And the scriptures talk, bless God, about somebody who's been raised from the grave for the express purpose of granting repentance and the forgiveness of sins. In the fifth chapter of the book of Acts, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to do what? For to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sin. You could ask the Lord to become a caller on him. Oh, God, here I am. Come thou, if it be thy will. Come on. Come on. And the scriptures still teach whosoever, isn't this wonderful, whosoever shall call. 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 Call on the name of the Lord. Shall we say. That's how men are able to repent. They become seekers and callers on the Lord. And he grants to them the ability to do what they can't do in themselves. Calling on the Lord. Men and women are in God's death row waiting the time of execution. They're locked up in the cell. The door to the cell is locked, and the key's not in it. And there's just one person that's got the key. God gave it to him. He put him on the throne, made him a prince and a savior to grant repentance to grant forgiveness. A sinner faced with God's command as the Lord Jesus Christ walks by in the gospel. The vilest old sinner out of hell can do this. He can say, Pass me not. Don't go by my cell door. Why are you unlocking the door for others? You got the key. You got the key. You got the key. Pass me not. Pass me not. Pass me not. Pass me not. God commands people 
doesn't give us a choice. Faces us with a duty. But you say, Brother Barnard, this word and I'm through. I know it preach long, but this is solemn. You can laugh at it, but I'm trying to help you meet the awful blasphemy that's going on around you. Listen. You say, Brother Barnard, men don't repent. God commands them to. You say, God don't give man a choice what he'll do with Christ. No. Because the day's coming when every knee shall bow. The day's coming when every tongue shall not decide what they'll do with Jesus, but bow to him. Bow to him. You don't have a choice what you're going to do with Christ. You're going to bow to him. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you become a caller on him and get to where you could bow to him now? When the blessed reward of submission to him now is to be brought into his sweet kingdom and made his dear child. That's grace. But young man, you don't don't, don't worry. God's not making people bow now, but he will one day. God commands you to bow now. The day's coming when he'll make you. The day's coming when he'll make you. Too late for salvation, but not too late for the glory of God. This is a solemn thing. This is a solemn thing. We're going to stand and sing a verse or two of our song, locked up in jail with no key. Jesus passes by. The sinner can cry to him. He can call on him. He can look to him. He can cast all his dependence on him. Oh, thou son of David, have mercy on me. If thou will, Lord, I know you can, I know you can. Oh, if thou will, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Brother Sower, let's sing a verse or two of 230. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art.